This is level two of the CFA program, the topic on alternative investments and the reading on private equity investments. Back in the old days of the CFA program, and when I mean old days, I mean when I went through it in the mid 2000s, uh, private equity was probably just a section or two inside of a reading on alternative investments. And the focus back then really was on startup companies and venture capital and how venture capitalists would provide support to these startup firms. But in recent years, as I'm guessing that you know, especially in the last decade or so, private equity has become much more. And of course, the CFA program has adapted to those changes. And so I want you to think of this as kind of like a timeline. Over here at the very beginning, we have a startup a super small company and all the way over here we have a massive large corporation large business large organization that has hundreds of millions of dollars in revenues let's say and private equity nowadays can inject capital it can take an ownership position at almost any stage in between those two extremes i know the cfa institute is not uh, too keen on including current events, but I wanted to give you just a recent example of the importance, the growing importance of private equity as uh, almost its own unique asset class inside of alternative investments. If you take a look at the 2021 Harvard endowment, about one third of its allocation is to private equity. And in 2021, it reported a 70, 77% return. Uh, on their private equity investments. So super important stuff. And for those of you who like to look at the readings, I was delighted to read about references to the capital asset pricing model and risk adjusted returns. I was delighted to read about Medigliani and Miller and their original 1958 capital structure irrelevance proposition which of course leads right into private equity because I'm guessing, as you know already before this slide deck, that private equity uses massive amounts of debt. And so the importance of leverage in the context of that original Medigliani and Miller proposition takes on even an added importance. I will say one final thing before we move on to the uh, LOSs is that uh, because of this massive use of leverage, when private equity investments fail, they, they tend to fail spectacularly and get lots and lots of news, but there are lots of successes out there as well. Let's go ahead and look at the learning outcome statements. And I wanna call your attention to the third one, compare and contrast characteristics of buyout and venture capital investments. For those of you who like to look at the readings, the authors emphasize in the first handful of paragraphs that this is how it views private equity in terms of buyouts and venture capital. So that's probably gonna be the emphasis throughout these LOSs and the slide deck that we have prepared for you. A couple other interesting ones here, look down somewhere in the middle, explain risks and costs. That's probably gonna be an important one and then explain private equity structures and all those uh, other inputs and outputs. And then we will get out our calculator at the very last one. We have a table for you and we'll go ahead and show you how to calculate all of those outputs. A couple of quick things in terms of a recap. Think of a huge company like Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson, which might have 10 billion outstanding shares, right? So what do we know about large corporations? They're defined by their separation of ownership, which are all these shares out there and the shareholders and control, which are the executives, the leadership team, the financial managers who control the assets, who make decisions, capital budgeting decisions and capital structure decisions, et cetera. However, with private equity, there's a concentration of ownership and that means that there are probably uh, different side goals 
to that old Medigliani Miller and Milton Friedman idea that the goal of the business is to maximize the wealth of the owners. When the ownership is concentrated, this might lead to different kinds of decisions or at least being aware of uh, scanning the environment, especially with this concept that we have tons of leverage out there that will drive decision making. Second point is that, of course, early stage businesses are valued much differently than leveraged buyouts and management buyouts all the way at the end. That's why I gave you that kind of a sense of the timeline that private equity can enter into this process at any given point in time. How about sources of value creation? I think this is an interesting potential exam question. I'm thinking about the question stem where you're given up in the top par paragraph, a couple of things about the business and then maybe some opportunities. Think of these as opportunities. So let's go ahead and go through these quickly. Ability to re-engineer the company to generate superior returns. All right, so I want you to think about uh, a sports example. Those of you who listen to me know I love sports and movie examples, but think about, think about uh, the USA uh, Olympic basketball team and its coaching staff. You know, uh, you have these tremendous college and professional coaches, and then they surround themselves with other tremendous basketball coaches. And then on top of that, layered is the historical Olympic basketball coaches that have had tremendous success. So you have all these super smart men and women coming together to try to achieve a goal, right? To win a gold medal. And so this is tends to what happens. There's a potential for this happening in private equity where you have experts. This is what's called re-engineering. And it's really a matter of coming in and saying to the leadership team, hey, this is what you do really well. And this is what you think we think you can improve on and it's that improvements there which may or may not contain uh, some kind of an embedded option in the assets of the company look at that purple one there this is what i talked about earlier uh, ability to obtain debt financing on favorable terms what do we know from medigliani and miller what do we know about the right hand side of the balance sheet that that all businesses would prefer to issue some type of a debt instrument because it carries a lower interest rate. However, it also brings in the specter of bankruptcy and financial distress costs. So we've got a marginal cost, marginal benefit. Uh, and one of the goals of the business, of course, is to borrow at the least weighted average cost of capital. And with private equity, there's tons of leverage out there. And so what we can do in the private equity equity industry is that not only might we have an advantage in borrowing money in originally, but because we can package these into collateralized debt obligations and sell them to wealthy investors over there, then that gives smaller firms and medium-sized firms access to capital that they probably wouldn't have had before, which hopefully right hopefully leads to a lower weighted average cost of capital or at least a weighted a lower interest rate on the debt now i really love this third one there better alignment of interest focus is concentrated on longer term growth and this is what you might hear in the financial press this is what you might hear from politicians is that private equity firms are only interested in short term returns well, that's probably a function of these massive amounts of debt and these debt service payments that come due, let's say every month. So you have to generate enough cash flow to pay off that uh, interest and principal payment. However, the CFA Institute and the authors here are keenly aware that, of course, that short term goals cannot supersede the long term objectives and the long term growth opportunities. And so that's what I like about this one. Focus is concentrated on longer term growth. Uh, how about some control mechanism? All right, so the private equity firm guarantees control through the board of representation. And of course, board members then get to decide with a majority vote of whether we want to 
take a look at what's going on on the right hand side of the balance sheet. Maybe want to we want to substitute debt for equity. Maybe we want to do the reverse. Maybe we want to do some financial engineering. So that's the restructuring part, and then takeovers, of course, go uh, hand in hand with that. Uh, non compete clauses. This is so the company founder doesn't say something like, okay, I'll sell you to you over there. And then I'm going to go over here and do the exact same thing. And I'm going to take my brain power and I have some embedded options somewhere in here. And I'm going to go over and do that over there. And I'm going to be much better prepared to handle it over there. And I'm going to compete with you guys over here. And then priority in, uh, in claims in the event of a liquidation. This, of course, then makes life a lot simpler on the right hand side of the balance sheet. And then there are matters that are reserved like acquisitions and divestitures. And of course, the private equity firm must approve of those. And then earnouts uh, are linked to the performance. And so the executives will say something like, all right, in order for us to receive this capital, in order for us to get paid, in order for us to move on and achieve these long-term growth opportunities and long-term wealth maximization, we need to take a look at a handful of financial ratios, make sure we're doing all the right things, make sure that we're being evaluated by independent auditors so that we know exactly where we stand. This is an interesting part of the reading and, and these two slides here. Notice we got two right back to back. Um, there's not much um, discussion on this LOS, there really is just a, a table, much like we've presented here. So my advice is for you to get out your phone and take a picture of this one, and then take a picture of this one, and then have it in your folder and take a look at these uh, regularly so that you know that these are great questions on the exam. Compare and contrast. So you have a question stem up here that gives you, you know, let's say 10 sentences, and then the CFA Institute can ask any one of these uh, characteristics going down the left hand side and ask you what's the difference and what are the similarities between the two. And these are probably super uh, obvious notions. If you think of venture capital, you know, kind of in general, as startups, if you think of buyout as kind of mature firms, if you think and distinguish between the two columns in that generality, you'd probably be able to answer these questions. And let me just go through a handful of these now that you've taken a picture of it. And I think they're self-explanatory. So take a look at the cash flows. So for venture capital, unpredictable and uh, not easily anticipated because there are so many variables that can go into the success, the early success or failure of, of a business. But then look over at the buyout investments and the, the reading does write it exactly like this. The cash flows are stable and predictable. I would prefer it to have read cash flows are at least more stable and maybe, maybe more predictable. Uh, skip all the way down to debt versus equity, since this is a theme. Remember, <laughs> Medigliani and Miller were mentioned by these authors early on. So debt versus equity. So venture capital, this is probably all equity, uh, a little bit of debt maybe, but then buyout investments, huge amounts of debt. And then the last one here, tremendous amounts of risk, venture capital. Um, tremendous amounts of risk under buyout investments. However, remember what I've said to you many, many times in previous recordings that good risk management involves identifying the risk, quantifying the risk, and then managing the risk. And that's what that bottom right says over there under buyout investments. Risk can be easily measured or quantified. It's much less easy. It's much more difficult to measure that in the early stages. So remember those two. All right, so you have a picture of that slide. So go ahead and get your phone out. Take a picture of this slide. Um, I'm going to skip all the way down near the bottom. So look under the returns. So very high returns from a limited number of highly successful investments, right? So you have all of these, and this is the beauty of diversification. So some are going to fail, but those that are successful are going to hit the far right corner of that normal curve, that normal distribution. Buyout investments, what this reading suggests is that there is lower variance, and I'm not going to argue with that. 
um, and bankruptcies are rare events over on that right hand side. All right, how about types of buyouts? What do we know? We can take over another company. We can be a part of the management of that company. And then the management can do all this work and buy uh, itself out. And then there are leveraged buyouts, which is, of course, mostly what we're talking about here from the private equity standpoint. And notice up at the top uh, circle point, a controlling stake in the equity capital. Remember, a private equity firm can buy 1% of a company or 10% or 51% or 100%. So probably look for that up in the question stem. Make sure that it's a controlling stake and that may or may not influence your answers. So how do we finance these leverage buyouts? Um, mostly the way we always finance uh, any kind of a positive net present value project. You know, we have uh, senior debt and then subordinated debt. Sometimes that's called speculative bonds. Sometimes it's called junk bonds. And then you can have uh, equity, which looks an awful lot like equity, no matter what kind of a business you're looking at. But then there's this interesting kind of an animal that is unique to private equity, this mezzanine finance, which is kind of a hybrid. It's a combination of debt and equity where you might provide the business with couple hundred million dollars and you might say, you know what, let's suppose that you guys are going to struggle over the first, oh, I don't know, three months or six months or 12 or 18 months. Don't worry about paying us back for that time period, right? It's a bond. Don't worry about paying us interest. And then maybe you can start paying interest after some given time period. And oh, by the way, if you can't pay interest, then that bond converts to equity. So it's kind of like a convertible security. What are these model inputs? Of course, we need to forecast all sorts of things like revenues, which are price times quantity. We have to forecast operating expenses, which will hire a consultant or maybe we're experts in the operations of this particular business or industry, which leads then all the way to the bottom of predicting cash flows. And what do we know about this prediction that you know we might feel like we have a pretty good handle on estimating it for the first six months or three months. But then as we get farther and farther out, the standard deviation of our estimate becomes larger and larger. It might, it might even become unwieldy. That's why it's appropriate to estimate things like value at risk or expected exposure. And then of course, another input, it goes back to that comment I made earlier about the weighted average cost of capital. Of course, you've got these bondholders and shareholders, which could be us or it could be some others. And we'll talk about who those people are here in just a second. But what do the people on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, what are they demanding in return? And then of course, the final question is not just the return, but the, how much is available? You know, if I wanted, if I had a, an idea about a new, let's say a new golf tee, and I thought to myself, you know, I need $100,000 to do this. You know, where would Jim get $100,000? Well, I could ask my family members and they might look at me and say, you know what, Jim, you're, you're not very smart. Here's, here's $100 or whatever it is. I could go to the bank and, you know, maybe I could get $15,000 or $20,000. So the amount of financing available is a super important input. Now look at this fancy little arrow we have over on the right. This is uh, a little bit of what I was talking about in that timeline earlier from original costs all the way to exit value. And so the question then becomes, how do we, how do we put this into some kind of a model? And here it is in simple circles at the bottom. And this is taken right out of, uh, right out of the reading. We have this pre-money valuation, which is super difficult to estimate. So imagine my company, what am I making? Golf tees. And let's suppose I've been doing this and I'm selling it, you know, in the local area. How do we value, how do we value my business, Jim's golf tee business? Well, that's super difficult to do because look, if you're the private equity firm, you're going to come in and you're going to rely on me to give you accurate details about my revenues and expenses and distribution networks and marketing and all that kind of stuff. So that's a difficult one. The private equity firm then can come in and say, all right, I'll give you a million dollars, Jim. So that in the blue there, that's an easy one. And that gives us post money valuation. Let's take a look at just a quick example here. 
company is worth 20 million. Oh, pre-money valuation, 20 million. Boy, it'd be awesome if the uh, CFA Institute just gives us that 20 million. And I, I think it probably will. But there's a really great exam question, follow-up exam question that might say something like, boy, how confident are you in that $20 million estimate? And the answer is probably, oh, well, it depends on how accurate the information that Jim gave us is. Uh, company raises $5 million from um, a venture capital firm, so pre-money is 20 New equity is five, so post money valuation. So boy, we learned that. Let me go back here quickly. I love telling my students this all the time because they always scratch their heads. You learn this in kindergarten, right? You have one circle and you have another circle. So you have one apple and another apple. That gives you two apples, right? So 20 plus five, that's $25 million. And there's the equity stake of 20%. And look at that first arrow point. Determining pre-money valuation is the biggest challenge. All right, we said that before. Now, going back to our uh, fancy little arrow there on the right, let's go ahead and figure out this exit value. So it's one thing to say we're going to give a handful of millions of dollars today, but what do we get out of it in the long term? And by the way, we, we don't really care if we get something next week or next month. Well, what, what we mostly care about is, the, you know, essentially the capital gain. I want in for five million today, and then when I exit in two or three or five years, maybe 10 years, I, I want, what did I say, five million? You know, I want 15 million or 20 million or 100 million, whatever that is. So that exit value is, uh, is extremely important to estimate, but of course, of course, it's, uh, it's difficult as well. So there's a simple formula right there, post money valuation, value at exit, uh, divided by some kind of return. Uh, how about stage financing? I like this one, X as a mitigator of risk. Let me go back and just repeat this. Identify the risk, quantify the risk, manage the risk. So early stage investors, of course they take on more risk, and they're going to demand higher returns. And so what happens then, stage financing, it just spreads out. This is just the effects of diversification. And of course, since we're going to be willing to give up access to this capital for a longer time period, there's a liquidity issue here. So there's that third uh, teardrop point. Pre-money valuations give insight into the performance of an illiquid asset class. All right, let's take a look at a quick example here. So 500,000 exchange for a six and a half percent stake. A year later, it raises 3 million, and then it's going to raise uh, 10 times that ROI, uh, closing valuation 450. And so we can do some quick math here, and this is really simple stuff. So post money valuation, we'll just do the multiple We'll demultiply it, right? So 450 divided by 10, that gives us 45. And then we go ahead and subtract out that $3 million. What did we say back here? Uh, there's Series B financing, $3 million. So that gets us down to $42 million. So the fractional ownership, six and two thirds. And then that ROI, you can go ahead and do the math there. Um, 450 over 45 is 10. So you can compute an internal rate of return. Of course, a lot of times this is referred to as the hurdle rate, and this is a simple calculation. You may or may not be uh, asked to calculate that. Uh, how about some various exit paths? So exit value. I like this blue equation that comes out of the reading. Investment cost, earnings growth, increase in the price multiples, and then we'll subtract any reduction in debt that occurs through all sorts of restructuring or return on those debt instruments. So what are some exit routes here? An IPO, we know about this from level one, right? Uh, equity is offered to the public through a sale, oftentimes results in the highest uh, exit value because not only are we appealing to investors here, but we're appealing to investors throughout the world. And so look at those bullet points, improve liquidity, better access to capital, and uh, recruit higher quality managers to go ahead and run the business. 
a less liquid market is in the secondary market. So we could just find somebody over there, maybe another private equity firm, or maybe a group of lawyers or physicians or other wealthy individuals who say, you know what, we'll take over this company. Management buyouts, that's a takeover by management. That's going to involve uh, tremendous amounts of leverage, or we can li liquidate. Here's a LOS that I like whenever there's the word risk in it. Um, I always piques my interest. If I were a question writer, which I of course am not, uh, I, I would focus on this one here. So you're probably not surprised to go down the left-hand column to read these liquidity risks. We talked about this, which is related to unquoted investments. Of course, since there's no publicly available information about this, we need to rely on assessments and evaluations and uh, and estimates. Uh, competitive risk here, high <clears throat> high competition. Yeah, I have an acquaintance whose uh, firm was taken over by a private equity firm, and uh, they had negotiations with you know all sorts of private equity firms over the last you know let's say five years uh, before they finalized the transaction, and so there's tremendous competition out there. Uh, eight, there's always an agency cost when there's separation of ownership and control. They may, these managers uh, inside of the private equity firm, this private equity portfolio, they may or may not act in the best interest of each individual shareholder. They may, when we look at their portfolio as diversified, what's best for that diversified portfolio. And then, of course, <clears throat> there's an increase in both business risk and financial risk. The reading refers to this as capital risk if there is a withdrawal of capital. And then, of course, you always have to worry about the government, right? Government could come in and say, you know what, Jim's golf tees, they're no good because they're made out of pine trees. And we're going to make cutting down pine trees uh against some kind of rules or laws or regulations. And then of course you have government agents who get to pick what kind of tax policies there are. So these can change all the time. Those of you who follow private equity in the financial press will know, and we'll see this here just in a little bit with an example, you know, how do you tax <laughs> capital gains? How do you tax dividends? All that kind of stuff. So it's fairly controversial. Valuation risk, subjective, of course. Let's go back to the capital asset pricing model. Let's go back to the discounted cash flow model, right? You have to make decisions on what inputs. And so what you might tend to do is select those inputs that are going to give you the valuation that perhaps you want that may not be accurate. <clears throat> And then finally, we're always exposed to diversification risk and market risk as well. Those go back all the way to level one and probably all the way back to what you learned in your undergraduate days. Now, the second part of this LOS, I think, is less interesting. <clears throat> However, it's uh, part of the LOS, so it's uh, a fair question on the exam costs, and you're not going to be surprised at these transaction costs, maybe some legal costs and administrative costs and accounting and auditing costs, uh, monitoring of management and performance costs, uh, due diligence costs. Uh, this is probably an interesting one down here. Notice the teardrop point. When stock option plans are granted, and I'm not even going to read the rest of that, but I'm going to recall you to our conversations with the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model. Whenever you have these stock options that are granted to executives of public firms or inside of the private equity industry, you have to value them. And those inputs are subject to lots and lots of good decisions, especially, especially of course, the standard deviation. All right, how about this private equity fund structure? So we have a limited partner arrangement, the fund manager, let's just suppose that's me. I'm the fund manager, I'm the general partner. Uh, and let's suppose that you guys are all the investors, you're the limited partners. Um, the general partner has management control and is jointly liable for all of the debts and so I'm going to go ahead and manage the investments. You probably are not going to. You may offer me, you may send me an email. Hey, Jim, I think you ought to do this. And I may or may not listen to you. Uh, and there's limited liability there. <clears throat> 
Most fund structures are closed ends, closed end funds, which means you send me your money and then I do a whole bunch of stuff with it. And then I'm probably going to say to you something like, oh, you know what? I'm not sending you any money for a year or five years or 10 years or 100 years. I mean, it could be almost any kind of a structure. There is this fund draft agreement, which is the result of the terms that you and I agree on the GP and the LP. And of course, what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with an idea so that I can take this flow of funds and send them to their most efficient use. This is why the CFA Institute is interested in having you guys learn about economics, of course. And so this is all part of allocative efficiency. Uh, let's see, we've got management fees, you know, a couple of percentage points. We have transaction fees. We have carried interest fees. We'll do that here in just a minute. We have these ratchet fees and a hurdle rate. I mentioned the hurdle rate earlier. Uh, target fund size, uh, the year the fund was initiated, and then the lifetime of the fund. I think I mentioned it could be almost anything, but you, typically it's 10 years. How about some other inputs here or some other elements that are interesting? The key person clause, uh, when the key name top management exits the fund, uh, there are some limitations there. Disclosures and confidentiality, clawback provisions, and we'll, we'll do this distribution of the waterfall here in just a second, or at least we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, but let me go ahead and link what's going on here inside of this LOS, explain private equity fund structures, right? According to all these things, let's go back to what we did in the very beginning of level one and the beginning of level two as well, where we have ethics and professional standards. And so this is a great question. Question stem up here that says something like, all right, here's this private equity fund. And then here are a couple of uh, issues. Are we violating uh, some of those professional standards. I think that's a great link between this LOS and the overriding archway that the Institute is demanding of all of us in terms of ethical behavior. Uh, you can fire me, right, if I'm the general partner, without cause when 75% supermajority agree. You can also fire me for cause. I tell my students this all the time that, you know, and I've said this in previous videos, that, you know, board of directors of publicly held companies have lots and lots of responsibilities, but their job is essentially to hire and fire the executive leadership team. And of course, there's a lot of stuff that goes into the support of that objective. And executives get fired for two reasons, for what I call incompetence, what this reading probably tends to refer to as gross negligence. And then uh, the second reason is for violation, violation of terms of the contract. And that's probably related to a key person event. Uh, and of course, there's bankruptcy in terms of my my own personal finances. Uh, minimum level of diversification, you know, that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, Co-investment as well. All right, how can we do this? Private equity valuation approaches. And we know this from uh, the CFA program, discounted cash flows. We can do multiples. We can look at real options which I've talked about a little bit earlier, and then replacement costs and venture and lever leverage buyout methods, which we've been talking about throughout this slide deck. How do we evaluate a private equity fund? Well, you're not surprised to see internal rate of return, but what's important is that we are able to interpret and compare gross IRR and net IRR, which we've got to consider management fees and carried interest and any other compensation paid to the GP. How about some quantitative measures paid in capital? 
How about distributed paid in capital? How about residual value paid in capital? And then we'll sum those two and get a total value uh, paid in capital. So I want you to think about these is that, you know, you got this right hand side of the balance sheet. So we're providing some kind of capital and then we want to make sure that we get some kind of return on it and we can do this with multiples and that's all we're doing here. How about some qualitative measures, realized and unrealized investments? How about cash flow projections? How about net asset value? How about financial statements? And then, of course, we need to look at benchmarking. All right, here's a really good uh, exam question. Let's go ahead and suppose the Institute gives us two funds, X and Y. And remember the LOS, compare and interpret. So we're given all of these metrics down the left-hand column and just a casual glance at fund X, we're probably going to say something like, oh, we prefer fund X way to fund Y. And of course, what we need to be aware of here is that fund maturity six years, fund maturity four years for X and Y. And we need to make sure, look at that last circle point down there, a fund should be benchmarked against peers of the same maturity or vintage in this case. So here's a good summary page. Uh, fund X distributed 253 in return for every dollar invested. Uh, that's super important compared to what 18 cents back here uh, the residual value indicates the fund will return 162 let me go back up here versus 103 uh, first quartile versus the third quartile yeah fund y less mature so everything everything seems to uh, indicate that we like fund x so let's attack this last LOS, uh, calculate. So here we go, all of those, all the way A through G. So what are we given in the question stem? Uh, initial management fee, 2%, carried interest, 20, committed cap, 200, that's mid millions. Um, so let's go ahead and try to figure this out. All right, so this is a summary table of what happens from 2015 all the way to 2020. Let me just go back here and remind you committed capital is 200. So look down that second column. So we have 80 and 25 and 20 and 40 and 25 and 10. So that sums in the next column, we'll call that paid in capital. So we'll do 80 plus 25 gives us the 105 all the way down to our committed capital of 200. So there are management fees, one six all the way down to four. So those increase over time. And there are the operating results. Notice that we have minus uh, operations in the first two years, then it turns positive, And then it uh, almost doubles, right, from uh, 2019 to 170. And there's our calculations before distributions of net asset value. So we start with a 70 and we work our way up to 388. Carried interest is going to be zero in those first couple of years because, because that net asset value before distributions is not greater than the committed capital. That carried interest only has value, only has positive value, once uh, the net asset value before distributions exceeds that 200. And there are some distributions there, and then the net asset value after the distributions. So let's go ahead and figure out how we computed uh, various numbers inside of this table. And so I want you to think about this table. Remember, now, when we started in year 215, all we know is that first is that first row. And we don't know those subsequent rows until, of course, time evolves. So imagine on a question stem, you're given part of this table and asked to compute the remaining parts or uh, even all of it. All right, so let's go ahead and 
take a look at a solution here. So paid in capital, I did that, right? So for 2017, that's 125. Whoops, I went the wrong way. So for 2017, that's in one, that's 125. So there we have the 80 plus the 25 gives us 105 plus the 20 gives us 125. That's a simple calculation in that column, right? All right, so management fees, those are 2% times the 200 paid in capital. So for 2020, whoops, I keep going the wrong way. So for 2020, we take that 200 paid in capital and we get uh, $4 million for 2020. And you can do that for any year as well. Carried interest, this is a little bit of the controversy that I was talking about before. How do we tax this carried interest? Well, let's not worry about that. Let's go ahead and just worry about how do we compute it? And so notice that sentence in there, carried interest is paid when the net asset value before distributions is greater than the committed capital. And so that doesn't happen. Let me go back here. That doesn't happen until 2018. Notice the 237 and a half is now greater than the 200. So in 2015, the 70 and then the 69 and then the 127, that's why carried interest is zero for those first three years. And so let's go ahead and compute that uh, 2018 carried interest. So we'll take the 237 and a half minus the 200. We'll multiply that by the 20% that we we're, were given in the question stem. So that gives us seven and a half million. So that's where we get that. And you can do that for the next rows as well. We'll go ahead and do one of those for you. So make sure that you are aware that it's just the increase in the net asset value. This is the waterfall that I was talking about earlier. So the 300, here, let me go back here. Let's take the 300 minus the 237 because that carried interest was already considered back in that, what year was that, 2018. So we get the 12.5 million for the 2019 carried interest. Moving on to the NAV before distribution. So we'll take the 127, um, which was given to us, right? Plus the 40 minus the 3.3 plus the 73. That gives us our 237.50. And then we'll subtract out that 750 carried interest, subtract out the 40 of the distributions, which it would have to be given to us in the problem. And that gives us 190. And we'll go ahead and do these multiples. So um, the distributed paid in capital, that's the 40 plus the 75 and then the 125, divide that by 200. And then the residual value, we'll take that 246 divided by the 200, that gives us 123. And so we'll just sum the 1, 2 and the 123, that gives us 243 for the total value to paid in. And I think that takes us through these LOSs. Uh, once again, let me remind you that um, I like that middle one there, explain risks. And of course, the CFA Institute loves to ask calculate questions. Although remember, the bulk of the exam is not going to be calculate, but that last one is important.